All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. So hello and welcome to Athenium Analytics webinar on hurricanes and loss tips uh, and tools for insurers to prepare for the 2019 hurricane season. Today we are really, really excited to be speaking with Dr. Phil Klotzbach, um, a research scientist at the Department of Atmospheric Science at Colorado State University. He received his PhD in atmospheric science from Colorado State University in 2007, and he's been employed with the Department of Atmospheric Science for the past 17 years and was co-author of the Atlantic Basin Hurricane Forecasts with the infamous Dr. Uh, Bill Gray through 2005. He became the first author on seasonal hurricane forecasts in 2006, and he's developed the uh, two-week forecast currently being issued during the peak months of hurricane season between August and October. He's published over two dozen articles in peer-reviewed journals, such as uh, the Journal of Climate and, and Weather and Forecasting. So we're really honored and just so privileged to have him be joining us here today. My name is Serena Arnold. I'm going to be your host for today's webinar. I'm the Vice President of Customer Success here at Athenium Analytics. I am a meteorologist, and before I was with Athenium, I worked at the Mount Washington Observatory, uh, was with NH1 News, and installed weather stations all across the globe. So my role here at Athenium is to uh, be a customer advocate and trying to help users solve complex weather and business-related challenges. So uh, really happy to be here with you all today. Also joining us um, for the second half of today's call is going to be Mike Bennett. Mike is our VP of Sales here at Athenium Analytics, and in his time here at the company, he's worked closely with the product teams and tech teams and has really been instrumental in shaping the direction um, of current and future products. So he spent time in business development to help spearhead the growth of Athenium Analytics into new industries, including construction, and he's managed strategic accounts for the company's largest customers and investors. So um, Mike is a graduate of Cornell University, and his background is in meteorology and data. So so, so happy to, to have him here joining us today as well. So we're going to go over the agenda for today's webinar. We're going to begin talking about uh, the 2019 season. What are we going to be expecting here with, with the 2019 hurricane season? While this is happening, using the uh, web or the GoToWebinar tool, you're going to be able to submit questions to Dr. Klotzbach for uh, us to discuss. So as we're going along and chatting with him, if you do have some questions, just type them into the submit box, and we'll be happy to uh, pull the popular ones here and, and do a live Q&A with him. We're then going to go over the 2018 hurricane season, review that a little bit talk about uh, hurricane statistics and some trends, and then we're going to talk about analytics and alerts for insurers and uh, post-event forensics and, and some things that are available to help with this upcoming 2019 hurricane season. A quick uh, assessment of what we provide overall, uh, Athenium Analytics has over 60 clients, including three of the top five PNC insurers in the US. And we're using deep machine learning, natural language processing, and artificial intelligence as well to help us with risk assessment, post-event forensics at half mile resolution, sometimes even better, aerial imagery, forecast alerts, and then quality assurance as well. So uh, we'll be diving into a little bit of details on those after we get done talking with uh, Dr. Klotzbach and talking about the uh, historical 2018 season. So we're going to go ahead and get started talking about the 2019 hurricane season forecast here with Dr. Phil Klotzbach. Dr. Klotzbach, it's just so great to have you here joining us today. Thanks so much for having me, Serena. Thanks to all of you for being in on the webinar today. Um, I'm talking with you about uh, the recent or the forecast we put out from Colorado State University in early April. Um, we're actually going to be updating that forecast uh, next Tuesday, June 4th, so stay tuned for that. So uh, let's move on ahead to the next slide. Um, this was the uh, forecast we put out on April 4th. We're calling for a slightly below normal overall hurricane season. A total of 13 named storms. Of those 13, five becoming hurricanes. And of those five, two becoming major category three, four, five hurricanes on the Saffir Simpson scale. Those are hurricanes with winds at 111 miles per hour or greater. And while they only make up about a quarter of the storms that form in an average year, when you take those storms and you normalize them by population 
the wealth per capita as well as adjust them for inflation. They do about 80 to 85 percent of all the damage that we observe from hurricanes in a typical season. So uh, those are the heavy hitters. And even though hurricane season starts June 1st, about 95 percent of all your major hurricane activity occurs after the 1st of August. So if June and July are quiet, that doesn't say much about the season. Um, so if you look overall, you can see our numbers are slightly below the long-term average of six hurricanes and three major hurricanes. Uh, you will see the number of named storms is a little bit higher than the long-term average, and that's because we're just naming more of these very weak, short-lived storms now than we used to, simply due to improvements in observational practices, improved microwave sensors, things along those lines that help us be able to detect some of these weaker uh, tropical cyclones. Um, so when it, we also use a couple of integrated metrics. One I want to call your attention to just briefly is this accumulated cyclone energy metric. And that's just basically a geeky number that we like to use because it takes into account the frequency, the intensity, and the duration of storms and convolves all of that into one number. So basically, it gives you an idea of how active um, a particular storm happens to be. So a storm like Hurricane Irma, which was a very, very long-lived major hurricane, generates a lot of ACE. Whereas a storm like Hurricane Michael, which obviously got very intense, but was only a uh, named storm for just a few days, didn't generate as much ACE. Um, so we use a variety of techniques to come up with our seasonal forecast. Uh, you know, we're not throwing darts at the board. We're not like my meteorological namesake, the groundhog, Punxsutawney Phil, waking up in the morning and looking to see if we can see our shadow. We use a lot of historical data and statistical modeling to come up with these forecasts. Uh, so if we move on to the next slide, uh, you can see here, these are the four predictors that we use with our April forecast. Um, these predictors work well at forecasting historical hurricane seasons. Um, so basically, if you're looking for an active hurricane season, in general, you want warmer water in the tropical Atlantic because warm water is fuel for tropical cyclones. More warm water means more fuel for developing tropical cyclones. Uh, you look also, we have a, a box for pressure. Lower pressure means a more unstable atmosphere more moisture also associated with a more active season. If you look in the tropical Pacific, we also have two predictors. Uh, one is just a forecast for water temperatures. Uh, there's a pretty well-known relationship between El Nino and Atlantic Basin uh, hurricane activity. When you have El Nino, which is warmer than normal water in the Eastern and Central tropical Pacific, what that does is it tends to increase upper level westerly winds that tear apart hurricanes as they're trying to develop and to intensify in the Atlantic. And so if you've ever read uh, discussions from the National Hurricane Center or just watched um, even just on TV, whenever they're talking about hurricanes, they often will talk about vertical wind shear. Uh, basically, wind shear is a change in wind direction with height in the atmosphere. Hurricanes like very little wind shear to intensify. So if you have a lot of shear, like we typically get in El Nino years, it tends to reduce the overall storm activity. So consequently, uh, for an active hurricane season, lower cooler waters in the tropical Pacific and warmer waters in the tropical Atlantic tend to lead to a more active overall Atlantic hurricane season. Um, and so if we move on to the next slide, uh, this is the forecast basic, or this is basically showing the skill of this model that we've developed. And if you look back, you can see the forecast does reasonably well, but there are some years where the model did not do well. And part of that reason is because this forecast is issued in early April. Early April is the first seasonal forecast that we issue. We don't want to issue one prior to that date. And that's simply because there's just too much that can change in the atmosphere and ocean system prior to April. Um, there's big uncertainties with El Nino. There's big uncertainties with how the Atlantic is going to shape up. And even in April, there's still quite a bit of uncertainty because even though the hurricane season starts June 1st, as I mentioned briefly earlier, you don't get, you're really, you don't really get major hurricane activity until you get to August in most years. So consequently, you still have several months prior to when the season really ramps up. And overall, there's just a lot of uncertainty and things that can change. Uh, but overall, the model does show some skill. And we do update our forecast, as I alluded to before. We'll update it on June the 4th. We'll also put out two additional updates during the early part of the hurricane season, one in early July and one in early August. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, we can look a little bit at basically kind of what are the large scale conditions um, that we think are going to be um, big factors uh, for driving what's going to happen uh, during the hurricane season. Um, so if you look at this figure, you can see uh, these are showing basically anomalies, so basically differences from the long-term average. If you look in the tropical Atlantic, you see, um, you know, some white, a little bit of green, a little bit of light blue, and that indicates that water temperatures in the tropical Atlantic right now are near their long-term average values. Um, they're not much warmer, they're not much cooler, they're just near their long-term average values. 
Um, and if you look in the tropical Pacific, you can see a lot of yellows and oranges indicative of a weak El Nino event that we currently have in place. And so two of the big questions obviously are, you know, is the Atlantic going to warm up faster than normal? Is it going to be a, um, have a lot of fuel for the storms? Or is it going to stay kind of near average like it is right now? And also, too, if you look in the tropical Pacific, we have warmer than normal water temperatures. As you can look at the figure on the right here, you can see sea surface temperature anomalies are much warmer than the long, or much warmer than the, the average right now. So we currently have a weak um, El Nino event in place. And the big question is, is that going to persist? And so there's a couple of things that we look at. We look at both water temperatures as well as um, what's going on deeper down in the ocean. And if you look at the upper ocean heat content anomaly, so the figure on the left, uh, basically what you can see here is that there's been a big decrease in the heat, although there's been a brief bump up in the past couple of weeks. And so there's not a ton of heat content to keep that El Nino event going, but there have been some um, basically very strong westerly winds in just the past couple of weeks that have tended to reinforce this warming somewhat. So at this point, we still think we're going to see a weak El Nino persist through at least the early to mid part of the Atlantic hurricane season. But there is still quite a bit of uncertainty uh, with that. And that's kind of the, one of the huge questions uh, that we'll be addressing in a lot of detail with our outlook coming out next week. Um, and obviously, we'll be co closely monitoring through the first few weeks of the hurricane season. Um, so there's a variety of different ways that we can basically assess uh, the likelihood of what's going to happen with El Nino. Uh, we can analyze it from a statistical point of view. We can also look at it from basically what numerical models are forecasting. And so a lot of these numerical models use what's known as an ensemble. And basically what an ensemble is, is, you know, you basically, you know what conditions are right now, but those, you don't know them perfectly. So there's basically, there's uncertainty in what's basically known as the initial condition. So, you know, if you have a thermometer that's measuring temperatures, it'll give you a reading, but that thermometer is not perfectly sighted. There may be, there's going to be some error bars in those measurements. And if you have a lot of very small errors, those small errors grow with time. And so what this shows is basically, this is a 50 member ensemble, also known as a spaghetti diagram, since the little strands look like or the little, um, the model that runs look like little strands of spaghetti. And if you look at this plot, you can see by September, there's a huge spread, uh, September being the peak month of the hurricane season, highlighted by the black arrow. You can see there's a huge spread. Uh, about 60% of the model members say El Nino is going to persist, but there's quite a few that say, no, we're going to be basically what's known as neutral conditions, which means neither El Nino nor La Nina, uh, basically near average water temperatures. And this is just from this one model. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, uh, the El Nino or the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, or ECMWF model that was shown in the last slide, is only one of many models. There's a whole lot of models forecasting El Nino. Uh, where there's both dynamical models, which are full physics models that are run on supercomputers, as well as statistical models, which are basically models um, that basically use historical type data, similar to what we use with a lot of our seasonal forecasting stuff. And if you look at the average of these models, um, they're all called, they're basically just above the El Nino threshold for August, September, and October, which again is the peak three month period for the Atlantic hurricane season. So as you can see from this, from this plot, there's certainly still uh, quite a bit of spread um, as to what is going to happen for the peak of the season. And again, we'll be talking about this a lot more um, as we move into the 2019 season. Um, and so we don't predict, you can't say months in advance when or where a storm is going to strike. But in general, more active Atlantic hurricane seasons have more landfalling hurricanes. There are certainly exceptions to this rule. Uh, 1992 is a prime example of that. We only had one major hurricane in 1992. That's all that was uh, predicted by a group at CSU, but it happened to be Hurricane Andrew. But in general, more major hurricanes do form inactive or do make landfall in active seasons. And so what we do is we basically take our historical probabilities, which are simply calculated from historical data, and adjust them based on our latest forecast. So on average, there's about a 50-50 chance in any year of a major hurricane hitting the US. Since we're forecasting a near average hurricane season this year, those probabilities are also near 50%. Uh, with a slightly below normal season that was forecast in early April, you can see those numbers are just slightly below the long-term averages. But all in all, the probabilities are near the long-term average values uh, for 2019. And so with our seasonal forecasts, uh, we do put out um, numbers that you probably hear in the news, but there's also an extensive document uh, that goes on um, that's on our website 
uh, that is, I'm sure there'll be the contact information that you can get, but it's tropical.colostate.edu if you're interested in uh, um, the extensive document that goes out when we put out our seasonal forecast. It's usually 30 to 40 pages long. If you're having trouble sleeping at night, you can certainly uh, download that and maybe it'll help put you to sleep as well. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you very much uh, for your attention to that presentation. And now I believe we'll be doing um, a little bit of question and answers here. Yeah, absolutely. And um, hey, there's some of us that would love to read through that in, in detail. Um, you know, just getting a taste of that information with you now is is really great and uh, really appreciate this insight. So we do want to go through a couple questions here. Um, you know, Dr. Bill Gray, um, you know, likely your mentor here, was really influential in beginning these hurricane forecasts that come out any, every year. And anyone who's followed meteorology closely and tropical meteorology, I'm sure, knows the name well. So, um, you know, tell us a little bit about the Colorado State University um, Tropical Meteorology Project and what it was like working with Dr. Gray. Yeah, so Dr. Gray was a, was a, fa a fantastic individual. Obviously, as you mentioned, uh, he founded the seasonal forecast. Um, and he just was made tremendous contributions. In addition to being the first one to do the seasonal predictions, he made fundamental contributions to, trop to tropical cyclone genesis, intensity change, structure. Basically, he had his fingerprints on all of tropical meteorology. Uh, if you're interested, we actually did publish a paper a couple of years ago in the bulletin of the American Meteorological Society where he, where he highlighted his, his research legacy. But in addition to being a great scientist, he was also a, a great mentor. He was my mentor. I got to work with him for over 15 years. And he also mentored over 20 PhD students and 50 master's students. So he just was um, what had, had just a tremendous amount of impact on a lot of people's lives. Um, and so Dr. Gray basically came out to CSU um, in the early 1960s. Um, the, our, our department was founded by uh, Herbert Reel, who was a, was a famous hurricane scientist. And so even though we're thousand miles away from the nearest ocean, uh, we got kind of got started with the hurricane uh, hurricane bent. And so people used to ask Dr. Gray, why are you forecasting hurricanes from Colorado? And he said, it's because the storm surge can't get you at 5,000 feet. I love that. That's that. Uh, that's a that's a very accurate answer. It's a true scientist right there. Um, so there's a, a lot of history there with Colorado State's program, your program that you know you are now the leader of. Um, you know, and it's looked at as a very valuable resource for information. So tell me a little bit about how your forecasts differ from other sources like NOAA and the National Hurricane Center. Yeah, so thanks, thanks for actually putting up this particular graphic. So this is actually from a website that um, our group at CSU developed uh, with, in partnership with the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, who actually hosts the website and did the lion's share of the web design on it. Um, so there's now, we're, we're, CSU, we're not the only group doing seasonal forecasting. Uh, we were the first, started in 1984, and we were the first ones, I believe, till 1998. Then uh, NOAA and other groups have started doing it too. And now we actually have 26 different groups submitting seasonal forecasts to our website. They are a combination of universities like ourselves, uh, government agencies such as NOAA, and then private weather companies like a Weather Bell and AccuWeather. Um, and um, so basically, if you're interested in getting a lot more details on seasonal forecasting, I invite you, certainly invite you to check out this website at seasonalhurricanepredictions.org. Um, but what, how our forecast differs, I mean, a lot of the tools that we use are going to be very similar to what NOAA uses. Uh, NOAA has um, access to some model data that I do not have access to. Um, a lot of two of the uh, or several of the NOAA forecasters are also uh, students of Dr. Bill Gray. Uh, so again, we do have a lot of similar uh, kinds of things that we're looking at. Uh, but there are there are a little bit different approaches that are used as well. So in general, you probably won't see NOAA forecasting a, you know an active season and thus forecasting a very quiet season. But there certainly may be some differences, and there's also just differences in the way that we uh, that we write our forecasts up in terms of how much length we go into describing each of the different factors. Okay, great. That that makes total sense. It's amazing to hear that um, Colorado State was sort of the, the front runner here and has been doing this for over 30 years. So there's a lot of history there and I'm sure lessons to be learned. And, you know, meteorology is a tight-knit community, so not surprising that uh, Dr. Gray and, and you as well have been able to um, touch a lot of other people within the industry. Um, and so you, you would think there would be some sort of scientific consensus. So that's that's great to hear. 
Um, so there's a graphic that we have that talks about the probabilities of storms making landfall in different states or different regions. I'd love a little insight, um, and I'm sure our, our participants would as well, knowing how these probabilities are calculated. Yeah, so basically these probabilities are calculated based on historical uh, long-term landfall probabilities. And so uh, when it comes to individual states, uh, we have probabilities at the individual state level, and these probabilities are calculated, um, they're slightly different than landfalls. And the reason that we use impacts as opposed to landfalls is because when it comes to a hurricane landfall, typically a hurricane only makes landfall in one state. So for example, last year, Hurricane Michael made landfall in Florida. However, it also brought sustained hurricane force winds to Georgia. Um, and so if you happen to have lived in Georgia and been significantly impacted by Michael, you don't necessarily care if the storm didn't officially make landfall in your state if your house was um, severely damaged or destroyed from the hurricane. So these are actually known as impacts. And so when we define an impact, it's basically just sustained hurricane force winds um, hitting your state. And the National Hurricane Center has this database. And so consequently, we have these probabilities um, for each state from Texas to Maine. And again, they're simply just adjusted by our forecast. So since the probabilities in early April were for a slightly below normal season, the probabilities were just slightly below their long-term average values. Okay, that's that's really helpful to know and um, absolutely makes sense here. I want to go back a little bit to reflecting on the 2017 hurricane season. And that was the one, if you could summarize it in as few words as possible, I think rapid intensification would do it. It was a, a buzzword. It's what we constantly heard. We had three storms that season undergo rapid intensification, which leads to major hurricanes that category three, four, and five. So give us a little bit of insight as to how you are able to determine um, or come up with that forecast for how many severe, you know, big hurricanes, major hurricanes we're going to see uh, for this 2019 season? Yeah, so basically when it comes to the seasonal forecast and when it comes to our outlooks, um, in general, our outlooks are going to generally do a better job of predicting the hurricanes and major hurricanes versus, say, the number of storms because you can get storms forming in kind of these marginal environments, weak storms. So a storm like subtropical storm Andrea that we had, you know, just a very weak, short-lived, subtropical storm, um, those can form in very marginal environments. Whereas to get a major hurricane, so to get a Michael or a Florence or an Irma, you need to have very conducive conditions. And so those are more the, for, the ones that we are going to be able to better predict on a seasonal time scale. Obviously what we're doing is we're trying to predict before the season starts, how active the season is likely to be, basically using, um, looking at the large scale conditions in the atmosphere and in the ocean. And overall, if the shear looks to be lower over a three month average period, um, you know, the shear is going to generally be lower on a day to day basis as well. However, there certainly are going to be periods maybe where you have higher shear or lower shear, even than what, what you anticipate for the season. But what makes the storms undergo rapid intensification on a short term time scale is obviously governed strictly by the day to day weather pattern. So we can't say, you know, on say June 1st, that a specific number of hurricanes are going to undergo rapid intensification, but most major hurricanes do undergo rapid intensification at some point during their lifetime. Yeah, that's and that's definitely what we saw frequently in 2017. And um, I know sometimes the forecast models have a really hard time keeping up with those changes when you see that rapid intensification. So it's um, it's a it's a gosh, it's a it's a difficult thing to forecast, that's for sure. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about hurricane trends. What are changes are we seeing with regard to intensity or frequency or damages as we're, you know, progressing through these, you know, hurricane season after hurricane season? What trends are you noticing? So uh, when you look at this plot here, you can look and see the number of uh, named storms and the number of hurricanes. There's, there's been a large, there's been a significant increasing trend in both of those if you go back to 1851. However, obviously, we know we have a much better observational network now than we did um, certainly prior to the satellite era, which is in the mid-1960s. Um, and so what some scientists from NOAA have done is basically tried to estimate the number of storms that we likely missed prior to the satellite era. And if we do that, then these eight large increases in the number of named storms and hurricanes goes away and actually matches up pretty well as what we've observed for the number of landfalling hurricanes. If you go back to the mid 19th century where the number of landfalling hurricanes is probably 
reasonably well observed because we may have missed storms over the open ocean, but most of the coastline along the U.S. coast was fairly densely populated since the mid 19th century. We probably, if anything, we may have missed some storms, but we certainly didn't overestimate landfalling hurricanes. There's been no trend in that metric. Uh, when it comes to damage from hurricanes, certainly that's gone through the roof. Um, but one of the primary drivers of the increase in damage to date are due to in growth in population um, as well as wealth along the coastline. Now, we have more money than our parents and grandparents did, which is a good thing in general, um, but that obviously leads to increases in exposure. And obviously, we have more people in coastal counties now uh, than we did, say, 100 years ago. And obviously, that tends to lead to increases in damage. And we actually published a paper in the Bolt and the uh, American Meteorological Society kind of addressing some of the drivers of the increases in damage um, that we've observed. Now, when it comes to climate change, you know, a lot of the arguments aren't necessarily that we're going to see more storms, maybe even fewer storms, but the storms that form may get a little bit stronger. Um, I think there's a little bit of observational evidence for that. Uh, there are still some challenges, just given the fact that our observational network is improving with time. And as the observational network improves, it basically just allows us to be able to observe these storms um, better than we used to. And also, as you get better satellite imagery, it helps you be able, basically, the better the satellite imagery, the, the stronger these storms appear to be. So there are some issues with that. But overall, uh, I think the storms potential, the, the, it looks like storms may be a little bit stronger in the future, but even if the storms themselves don't change, um, warmer atmosphere is gonna hold more moisture. So we could potentially see more rainfall from the hurricanes. And simply just due to sea level rise, a uh, few inches of sea level rise to a foot of sea level rise doesn't necessarily seem like a lot, but in very low lying areas, that can lead to um, significant increases in coastal inundation. Yeah, I mean, those are all the, the key factors that you hit on here with regard to climate change, and it's a great observation on some of these trends. Uh, follow up here while we're looking at this graphic, I know the first satellites that went up into space that allowed us to view some of these storms that we may be missing um, were launched in, what, was it the 1970s? Yeah, so we actually had a few um, starting in the, in the early to mid-1960s, uh, but we didn't get global coverage, really good global coverage, honestly, until even like the mid-1990s when we had really good global coverage um, for observing space. So we didn't have directly overlooking satellites in parts of the southern hemisphere um, until the mid to late 1990s. So that, that's why the Atlantic, we probably have pretty good data going back to the mid-60s, but some of these other basins where we get tropical cyclones, um, we didn't have very good data even in the 70s and 80s. Um, and so the Atlantic is only about 12% of all the storms that form around the globe in an average year. So uh, we really need to get, especially in the Western Pacific is the, the basin that generates the most storms, uh, named storms and typhoons, they generate the most in an average season. Gotcha. Yeah, that's, it's interesting to take that type of information into account when we're looking at these, you know, long-term graphs, looking at over 150 years here. It's uh, always important to note the technological changes that have happened at those same times. So we'll go on um, and do one, one more question here. I want to talk a little bit about the factors that lead to damages and losses. Um, you know, from your perspective, what are those key hurricane factors that are causing the most damage out there? Yeah, I mean, so there's there's a lot of things that go into basically, you know, driving losses. Obviously, if you happen to make, if a storm happens to make landfall in a, in a very um, low low population area or no population area, the hurricane doesn't do much damage or no damage. In the case of uh, probably the most recent example of that would be Hurricane Brett, which made landfall in, in King Ranch, Texas in the late 1990s. Um, and so while the storm was a major hurricane, it made landfall in the area with very few people. So Overall, it did very little damage. Obviously, if Brett had made landfall in Corpus Christi um, or someplace nearby, that obviously would have done a lot more damage. Um, so, the, as I mentioned, with the answer to the climate change kind of question, you know, it's basically having large populations, especially in storm surge prone areas, can lead to huge can lead to huge damage and losses. Obviously, too, if you get these very very slow moving storms, um, these slow moving storms can drop tremendous amounts of rainfall. I um, mean, it's not just the fact that the storms are slow moving. If they can interact with frontal features um, from, say, the middle latitudes, that can help enhance the rainfall. Anytime you have storms um, interacting with uh, topography, so getting over more hilly or mountainous terrain, like we see in the uh, Carolinas uh, with the Appalachian Mountains, that can obviously exacerbate the rainfall totals as well. So, you know, these kind of these slow moving storms can cause a lot of damage from rainfall. Obviously, very large in size storms, in addition to the intensity 
storms that are very large in size tend to have more storm surge, um, and that obviously causes huge issues. Um, also, too, there's certain parts of the United States coast where storm surge is just more likely, just given the way that the coastline is shaped. So if the coastline, or basically if, the, if your coastal shelf, basically if it's very gradual off the coast, um, so basically if it's a very gradual slope down off the coast, that can mean exacerbation of storm surge as well. So places like Southwest Florida um, have very high risks of um, tremendous storm surge, but obviously too, thankfully they don't get as, as, as they're not as often impacted as say the east coast of Florida, just given the prevailing storm tracks. Um, but certainly th th those kind of issues can be um, can be huge drivers of damage as well. Yeah, absolutely. So as a follow up then, um, as the expert here, what do you think insurers can do to help prevent hurricane losses? Uh, well, I, I don't think you can never really, you know, you're never going to be able to prevent all losses. But I think, you know, I mean, one of the big things for me is obviously you, you can build a house to withstand, you know, maybe not a Hurricane Michael force winds, but you can build a house to withstand most winds that you're going to get from, from a typical hurricane. Because even if a hurricane makes landfall to Category 4 or 5, very, a very, very small area is actually going to experience those strongest winds. Uh, but really the key is the storm surge, right? I mean, if you have, you know, if your house is built two feet above sea level and you have a six foot storm surge, it doesn't really matter how strong your house is built, uh, the, the, the waves and the, the water is going to just inundate it. And so, you know, basically getting water in a house is what really causes the damage, especially in the south. You know, it's very, very hard to mitigate the mold and the mildew. And, you know, I have colleagues work at, that work in insurance and they say, you know, six inches to a foot of water in a house is often enough to condemn it. So it, it's really, to me, the key is building houses high enough to be with out of the storm surge zone is really the key um, to ameliorating a lot of the damage um, that we see from these future storms. Okay, no, that's that's great to know. And I, I there is always going to be those risks with the big major storms, the fours and the fives, and not much you're going to be able to do with those. But um, making the impacts of the smaller storms not as, uh, you know, not allowing as much damage to happen to the property, it's it's logical. Uh, we're going to go ahead and allow some audience questions now. So for those who can uh, type those and have some questions, feel free to go ahead and ask away. We'll pull one or two of them here to ask uh, Dr. Klaus Bach while we've got him. The first one I'm going to ask here um, says, how important is the Saharan air layer in impacting your forecast accuracy? Is there a way to incorporate the Saharan air layer into seasonal forecasts? Uh, well, that's a, that, that is a very good question. We're actually working on uh, on this. We've actually looked a lot at this topic over the past few months. We have a paper that's currently going through the review process, and we're hoping, um, literally the emails flying back and forth uh, today, hopefully going to be able to start doing some better kind of quantitative analysis of the uh, of the how much dust is over the tropical Atlantic and Caribbean um, during the early part of the season. So the dust is really a big factor in the early part of the season, so May, June, July, and August. And so it's not a super straightforward relationship between the dust and the, and the hurricanes, because when you get very strong, basically we're known as easterly waves, so the thunderstorm complexes cutting off Africa, they often bring high levels of dust off with them. And, and so that's not necessarily a sign that the season is going to necessarily be quiet because strong waves are the ones that often will eventually form into tropical cyclones. What we found is that it's actually how much dust gets out into the Caribbean, because that means you have very strong low and mid-level winds, a lot of shear, and a lot of dry air extending further west. And so we do intend that basically to start taking into account um, some of the dust data uh, when we do our early August update, um, where you actually have the dust concentration in June and July. But I think in a lot of ways, it's, it's not necessarily the dust particles themselves, but it's just the environment overall that's in, that it's embedded in. So if you look at things like surface pressure, low and mid-level winds, and moisture, you get a lot of what, what, what is really kind of coming out from the dust. And we do have some of those factors in our statistical models that we put out, um, especially in July and August. Okay. And there's definitely a lot of variables when it comes to, uh, to forecasting. Um, it's just such a... It's a um, little difficult, isn't it, Phil? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and a lot of it, too, is that, you know, these, these variables are all very strongly correlated with each other. So, you know, if you correlate the water temperatures and the shear and the dust, it, all these correlate together very strongly. So 
when you try to model these statistically, if you have one of them and you add another one, it might not actually explain that much more variability. And that's one of the challenges that, 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 that we have when we do these as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're gonna, with that transition to our last audience question here, and that is, um, can we predict flooding ahead of time? Um, you know, not not on the seasonal time scale, I don't think, but I think you can certainly can, you know, and I think especially with Florence and with Harvey, you know, the, the forecasts of, of the flooding were really spot on several days in advance. You know, they were really highlighting that as being the, the big problems with these storms. So, you know, for example, Florence was a category four and there was a lot of talk about, you know, okay, maybe the storm's actually gonna be a category four when it makes landfall. Um, and even as the storm was weakening, um, so the winds were coming down, you know, they kept emphasizing just how big the threat still continued to be because um, it was going to be, they knew it was going to be moving very, very slowly once it made landfall. And that's obviously caused, that was obviously a huge problem um, with that particular storm. And so I think, you know, we can't do it on a seasonal level, but certainly, you know, the, the flooding wasn't particularly surprising. Uh, the woeful floor in with Harvey, it was pretty well anticipated. Yeah, I know we were uh, here at Athena Analytics. We're really looking at those storms as they came in as well, and um, trying to understand what was going to be happening there, and in putting that information into our own forecasts. And um, it's it's nice to see where the technology has really come, not just for us or even for you, but overall for the past several years. I mean, forecasting technology has really evolved um, here over the past you know ten years, thirty years, sixty years. So it's it's really great to see this progression and change here. So. Um, well, thank you uh, so much, Dr. Klosbach, for joining us today. I think this has been really insightful and extremely helpful. Um, so thank you so very much for your time. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so with that, we're going to go ahead and talk a little bit about the 2018 hurricane season and, and taking a look back at that. 2018 was uh, a year where we had 15 named storms, eight total hurricanes, two of which were major hurricanes. We saw 49 billion in total damages and about 12 billion in insured losses. And I think one of the important things to note here is that average hurricane years like forecast for this year and what we saw last year, they're still very expensive years. Major hurricanes, uh, category three or greater like we've talked about, are only a quarter of the storms we see, but as Dr. Klotzbach said, they represent about 80 to 85 percent of the damage, and that's obviously extremely costly. Um, and so, the what anything we can do to mitigate those risks and understand what's um, you know what we can do ahead of time is going to be helpful because um, even the the average year is a very very costly year. So if we look at 2018, there's two storms that really jump out at us. There was Hurricane Florence that happened at the end of August through uh, early to mid-September, and then Hurricane Michael that occurred in October. Hurricane Florence was a Category 4 storm, had 140 mile an hour max winds, and was uh, extremely, extremely rainy, you know, 35 inches, 36 inches almost of rain in Elizabethtown, North Carolina. Um, it was a Category 4 storm. We saw 24 billion in damages from Hurricane Florence and 5 billion in insured losses. And this is a storm with the amount of precipitation that it produced, that was really the a big story here. It was the wettest storm in North Carolina history with a lot of places seen, as you see in this graphic where we're looking at these, you know, purples and dark reds, up to three feet of rain in these locations. And those that are familiar with the topography of North Carolina here along the, the coast, it's flat, but the further inland you move, the, the more hills you have and the more you have to worry about drainage. Um, and was just a, a very devastating storm with regard to the amount of rainfall and the flooding that occurred. Hurricane Michael made landfall in October of 2018, and this is one that has made the news again just recently, as some people may remember, as it was upgraded to a Category 5 storm not that long ago. It was actually when they were doing the assessments and looking back, they realized it had winds that reached Category 5 strength, 160 miles per hour. So this was a storm that produced 25 billion in damages and insured losses of about 6 billion. And this was the strongest hurricane to ever hit the Florida panhandle. 
So once again, an, an average year here can definitely be a, a costly year. So we're going to look a little bit at hurricane trends and loss data overall. I think everybody here is understanding of the fact that tropical cyclones are one of the world's most expensive peril. If we look at this graph here, we can see um, 2018 is the are the blue bars. The average year from 2000 to 2017 is the yellow. Um, and looking at the different perils, tropical cyclone all the way on the left there being the most costly with regard to billions of dollars in losses followed by flooding, you know, your typical SCS, severe convective storm weather and drought and wildfire and so on, and it keeps moving down. So uh, tropical cyclone definitely being the primary loss mechanism and the reason why we're all here today talking about this. Hurricanes also represent seven of the top 10 most expensive natural disasters just within the US. So if we look and see this uh, purplish color that sort of is dominating this graph here, that is where we're taking a look at the tropical cyclones or, or the hurricanes here in the United States. You can see there's other events on here such as droughts that are you know, able to cost billions of dollars and flooding as well, but it's definitely dominated by the hurricanes, the Katrina in 2005, 163 billion in losses, uh, followed by Hurricane Harvey, that storm that came on the Gulf Coast of Texas in 2017 and rained and rained and rained and caused catastrophic flooding around Houston and, and along the Gulf Coast there. We also look and can see that hurricanes represent 17% of the billion dollar disaster since 1980, but over half of the total losses. And if we look at this graphic from NOAA, we can see that we're looking at a larger amount of those losses obviously occurring in the southeastern United States, where the totals are just getting up into the billions. And 42 tropical cyclones have caused a combined 927 billion in total damages. So coming up here over the past 42 cyclones, coming up on a trillion dollars worth of losses. The things that uh, Dr. Klosbach highlighted here as the main reasons why we're seeing this increase in, in costliness and these increase in damages has a lot to do uh, with precipitation events. So seeing these extreme one-day rainfall events and these heavy rains that are coming from these storms, showing here in this graphic, nine of the top 10 yearly records have happened since 1990. Combine that with the population growth that we talked about, and just like Dr. Klosbach said, seeing more populations, more people, more wealth populating these coastal areas, it's definitely leading to more damages along the Atlantic and the Gulf Coast. So looking at this graph, you see the, the increases here with respect to time from 1940, um, you know, nice steady linear increases here um, all the way up to the, the mid-2016 timeframe. And this data isn't just coming from NOAA. Uh, we're seeing it from the Congressional Budget Offices as well. They're talking about um, numbers that are slightly different, but still painting the same picture. 28 billion in annual losses across the United States. And the annual losses are expected to hit 39 billion. That's an increase in 40% by 27, uh, 2075. So lastly, then too, we're gonna show, um, you know, like we've been saying, even the average hurricane season can really bring devastating losses. So the big question is, are you prepared for that next billion dollar hurricane? We look back and we see Andrew in 92, Katrina in uh, 2005, they look a little bit like outliers. You look at the most recent trends here from 2012, 14, 15, 16, 17, you can see that there's there's some rising happening in this graph and so the, the costliness here is just going to continue to grow. So with that, I wanna talk a little bit about hurricane forecasts and the analytics and the alerts and what can be done about it. So uh, we have Mike Bennett, who's gonna be joining us here. He's our vice president of sales here at Athenium Analytics. And he's gonna to talk to you about how you're able to plan your response five days sooner with Athenium Analytics compared to using information like from the National Hurricane Center, how you can track your policy exposures in real time and how you're gonna be able to settle claims quicker with post-event um, analytics that we're able to provide. So uh, Mike, with that, I'll go ahead and pass it off to you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Serena. Um, I'm gonna be uh, uh, showing my screen here now, and, and we're gonna show a couple of tools that, that we offer here at Athenium Analytics. And we like to say that we uh, allow insurers to 
uh, manage, mitigate, and document their risk. And the tools that we're going to show you um, here, briefly at least at a high level, show you how you can utilize um, uh, these tools in, in the case of tropical systems and hurricanes uh, in, in ahead of the system, during a storm, and also after the storm. Uh, so the first one that I'm going to show you here is an example uh, taking a look at what we offer during um, Hurricane Irma. Uh, we have a team of meteorologists here at Athenium Analytics who have developed a machine learning super ensemble forecast system. Um, earlier, Dr. Klotzbach mentioned uh, what ensembles are, but if you missed it, uh, they're essentially uh, different runs of, of a, a computer model that tweak different conditions to produce uh, slightly different results. And the idea is that you use that aggregated and mean uh, of those ensembles in a super ensemble to create a forecast track. What our scientists meteorologists here at Athenium Analytics have done is create a machine learning super ensemble system that plucks out the best models and ensemble members of a 93 member uh, super ensemble for each different, uh, for each scenario. So certain models or ensemble members may do better with storms that form uh, out in the uh, the eastern Atlantic. Uh, some may do better with storms that form in the Caribbean. Uh, some may do better with rapid intensification, and some may be do better with uh, uh, slower moving storms. And with each storm system and each forecast that they produce, the model learns over time which ones do better with what, and it applies those uh, corrections and those bias uh, corrections uh, to the upcoming forecast. So ideally, we continue to improve this model over time as we go. And uh, taking a look at a couple of the storms of the last couple of years, we've really improved that forecast. This example you see here, uh, where you see the black on the screen, that is the actual track of Hurricane Irma uh, back in, in 2017. So if you follow the black, it went uh, just to the north of Haiti and Dominican Republic, uh, kissed the edge of, of northern Cuba here, and then made a hard right turn into Florida, uh, making landfall around the Naples area. Starting about six days out from landfall, that's where I'm showing you what our forecast system provided. So we're providing a 10-day uh, forecast that updates uh, four times daily uh, across the globe. It's a global forecast system. By providing those extra five days, it really allows an insurer uh, to be able to manage and, and allocate their resources properly in, in the case of, of a impending tropical system and to understand what their potential loss would be from this storm. So this was six days out. If you were taking a look at a five-day forecast, it would have ended right around here as it's just getting ready to leave uh, the Cuba area, the Cuba coastline. Uh, at that time, there was no northward turn in the track. It was essentially just headed through Cuba and then the track would have ended. But by using the Athenium Analytics forecast, you could see that it would, you would have seen that turn to the north and you would have seen that landfall. Six days out, we pegged the landfall to within about 50 miles of where it eventually actually made landfall. So we did a really good job with the track with Irma. Here's some other things that you can do uh, once you're using the forecast system. Let me move my controls over to the other side of the screen and we'll take a look at our, our swath forecast. So we're providing a, a look at what that swath forecast may be uh, for say, uh, in this case, category one through category four. We'll zoom in a little bit on the state of Florida here. And what we can do is take uh, policy locations that have been uploaded or that you want to upload it uh, in time and create either a radius or a polygon or using these uh, predetermined wind speed swaths to see what your actual exposure would be at any one location. So let's say you wanted to focus around landfall and you wanted to draw a polygon from Sarasota out to Sebring uh, down into the Everglades and figure out what your actual uh, total insured value would be in this location. You could apply some predetermined uh, correction to that to determine what your potential losses would be. And we can now view what that TID is within this polygon. We could zoom into any one of these locations, click into them, uh, view the information associated with it that's being passed through APIs that have already previously been set up. And any kind of information or data that you're sending us would be included here. And then you could export this little as a spreadsheet as well. So it's a way to track storms in real time, again, with updates four times daily. Uh, it's a way to view your exposures on top of those tracks 
and understands what your actual probabilities of, of not just landfall, but of true wind speeds would be. So your tropical storm wind probabilities and your hurricane wind probabilities as well. So that's ahead of the storm system. Uh, briefly, I did want to touch on what we offer after the storm system. So we have a post event tool here called Dexter, which we uh, debuted the hurricane tracking Dexter uh, tool last year. And at a highly granular basis, down to about 0.3 square miles, we are providing post event forensics and post event analytics. So this would be a look at uh, for Hurricane Michael, the wind gusts at any one location, uh, broken down by category. And then again, you could view your exposures on top of that. So if you had any particular exposures in this area and you wanted to export a spreadsheet that had those wind speeds appended to it, you'd be able to view that. You could view, say, rainfall. This was a look at Hurricane Florence rainfall. And likewise, add your exposures to that, export that spreadsheet. We offer sustained wind, uh, tornadic storm rotations, um, storm surge that's modeled through our, uh, our internal models. And then we also offer uh, some more custom elements like damage ratio assessments, uh, in which our PhD structural engineer on staff has created a damageability model that is, is used to uh, apply certain corrections to the, the post event forensics and using different building attributes is able to calculate what an expected damage ratio would be. Finally, last year, for the first time, we offered uh, post event forensics uh, through high resolution imagery. So we offered our, our clients high resolution imagery uh, almost immediately after the storm. Um, in some locations, it was within a matter of days. Uh, in some of the less impacted areas, uh, we offer this imagery within a, a few weeks. But using this imagery, you're able to zoom in and see actual losses down to essentially the shingle level. That would just be an example of it right there. Now, each one of these tools obviously has a little bit more to it, a little bit more in the way of bells and whistles. Uh, but I did want to just touch on on those for now, show you a list of uh, uh, of a couple of the products that we're offering uh, for the upcoming hurricane season. Um, of course, if, if you want any more information on that, uh, we could throw back on onto here uh, our website information, athenium.com forward slash hurricane. Uh, if you want a personalized demo, you want to see a little bit more in the way of what these tools can offer, you could always email myself as well, mike.bennett at athenium.com. Uh, with that, I, I want to hand it back over to Serena to see if we have any last questions that have popped up. Uh, but otherwise, thanks again to, to everyone for hopping on today. Thanks, Mike. That was uh, very helpful and beneficial to see. Um, talk to me a little bit about the imagery you were showing and what the source of that data is. Yeah, great question. So it's a high resolution imagery that's at uh, uh, seven centimeters per pixel, so about 2.8 inches per pixel. Um, it's actually through a aerial imagery provider where they're, they're strapping cameras on the bottom of planes. So it's, it's not satellite imagery. Um, it's, it's higher resolution than that, much higher in, in several areas. Uh, most satellite imagery, you're talking at highest resolution, uh, maybe 15 to, uh, to 20 centimeters per pixel. Uh, so we're at least twice as better. And, and in some of these cases where you're talking about a few missing shingles on the roof or perhaps damage to, to the siding, uh, it's important to be able to get to the highest resolution possible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanna talk a little bit too about the, the resolutions. So, um, you know, the, the post-event forensics showing that resolution, um, like you talked about down to, what was it, a, a third of a square mile you were saying, Mike? Yeah, so slightly less than even a, a third. So 0.3 square miles is our high resolution um, uh, post-event forensics, again, for the, the winds, wind gusts, for rainfall, for tornadic storm rotation. Um, and then our storm surge modeled is actually at 10 meter resolution, so even higher resolution on that. Fantastic. We'll uh, wrap this up with just one last audience question then, and that is the hurricane tool, um, the one where we showed the wind speed contours. Um, that is available now, right, Mike? That's correct. 
Yep, we have it available right now. Um, all the tools you see here are available right now. So if you want more information on, on anything like pricing or, or how the, uh, the seats work with it, again, feel free to email me at that, um, that uh, address you see right there. Fantastic. Great. Thank you so much, Mike, for your time. Really appreciate you walking through what Athenium Analytics is able to do to help insureds better weather a bad hurricane season or an average hurricane season, just any hurricane season, really. So uh, sorry, sorry about the pun here, but I uh, can't help myself sometimes. Um, so to everyone here who's been able to attend, we really thank you so much for your participation. Special thanks again to Dr. Phil Klotzbach for being here, um, to Mike Bennett for talking to us about these projects. Products. If anyone does have any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to check out our website, athenium.com backslash hurricane. We'd be more than happy to uh, get in touch with you and answer any follow-up questions that you have. So thank you again so much for your time and for joining us today and look forward to having you join us on our next webinar. More info to come on that. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day.